Hello, everybody, and welcome to IMB 45. This is the Independent Music Business Series. Uh, thank you to Edwards Creative Law and Ontario Creates, as well as the City of Ottawa for funding this project. We're super happy to be here today. Uh, too bad we couldn't meet in person. We were really excited to meet in person, but uh, what can you do with the weather, you know? That's how it is. Uh, my name is Melanie Brule. I'm the new executive director at OMIC. Um, I've been here since about May and uh, had a touring career for a long time and have done a lot in the back end of the music industry. Um, I have done some PR, I've done some radio tracking, I've booked a festival, I've mopped the floors, you know, it's, uh, I, did, I did most of that stuff to, um, to help my own career along. Um, and now I get to use all these tools that I've gathered along the way in this job. So I'm super happy to be here. Uh, I am even more happy to introduce to you a couple of key players in this radio game, uh, both based in Ottawa, which is awesome. Uh, Matthew Bisson from Element FM and uh, Barry Rook. And uh, I'll pass it over to Matthew. Matthew, you can introduce yourself and let us know who you are, what you do, uh, and why you got into it in the first place. Thank you, Melanie. Ani Bourgeau, hello and welcome. Uh, yep, I am Matthew. I'm from First Peoples Radio Element FM here in Ottawa. Hope everybody's had a chance to check out their station, but we're an Indigenous-focused radio station that supports Indigenous artists, uh, culture, language, and whatnot. About 30% of the music we play every day is by Indigenous artists, and we combine it with some of the other biggest artists from across the world to just uh, have that sort of platform where you can see that the Indigenous artists are really doing their thing very well as well. So I've been doing uh, working in radio for almost 20 years now, and uh, so I've had my share of experience uh, definitely more on the commercial side of things. I've spent uh, many years working for Bell Media, uh, Rogers, and Chorus as well. I did have some experience on the campus community radio side of things as well, though, as a longtime volunteer at CFRC and then briefly as station manager for CFRC, which is 101.9 FM at Queen's University in Kingston. Um, been doing radio for a while and just absolutely love it. For me, it really was a love of music that got me into the industry. And so I think it's appropriate that that's what we're focusing on talking about today. But uh, yeah, really looking forward to help. Uh, one of my favorite things about my time at Element FM is just having our bi-weekly music meetings and going over what new music we're going to select and some of the things we uh, you know, consider when making those decisions. And we'll certainly get into a lot more details about that today. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Matthew. Barry. Yeah. Hi, tell us who my... you are, what you do, and why, why you do it. Uh, my name is Barry Rook. I'm the executive director of the National Campus and Community Radio Association. So we are a nonprofit organization that helps nonprofit radio stations across the country. Matthew is one of our members and in a couple of different ways. So we go back a little while. Uh, as I said, we have 120 uh, stations, about a third of them are campus stations, two thirds are community based stations, there's around a dozen indigenous licensed stations, and a few online stations. The thing that sort of combines them all together is they all operate under the not for profit model and sector. So they're each individual organizations, they all have their own board of directors, and are there to really service their local community, where we come in at the National Association is trying to help those stations to achieve what they want to at that local level and provide them with services and benefits. So we do a lot of training and education, uh, a national awards program, lobbying and advocacy. Um, and one of the big things is around services and music distribution is something that's come up in the last handful of years. So when I started um, myself in community radio when I was 15, um, I walked into CFRU in Guelph, Ontario, uh, and had a chance to uh, to, to be programmer there for close to 20 years. I was also staff and board and, and all of that. And it led me here to the national side of things about seven, eight years ago. Um, and when I first moved here, I realized that there wasn't a music distribution platform designed specifically for the needs of campus community and Indigenous radio stations. So we set aside uh, developing what is called Earshot Distro. It sort of goes along with their Earshot branded uh, platforms and programs. Um, and we'll have a chance to be able to share uh, information around that as a service, uh, as well as uh, maybe take a quick peek on how you can use it. And we have some uh, coupon codes and so on for you to use as well, if you'd like to access it yourself. 
Awesome. We love your shot. We love what you both do. Um, let's maybe start with talking about the difference between commercial radio and community radio. Matthew, I know you have experience in both, but you're working mostly in the commercial sphere. Uh, and then Barry, maybe you can show us a little bit about your shot and while we talk about what, what community radio is all about. Matthew, do you want to start on this one? Yeah, for sure. So I think one of the main differences that you know, might be fairly apparent to some is that commercial radio stations obviously are very uh, structured in their playlists and what do they do. So, you know, you might have a station that is country that, you know, if you're a pop artist and you're like, mm, I really want to make sure I send my music up to everybody, that country station might not really bear fruit sort of thing. So just a lot more structured and playlists are highly, highly uh, scrutinized and it's very sort of, I would almost say mechanical kind of thing. Um, especially with a lot of the big corporate broadcasters like Bell Rogers and chorus, it would not be uncommon for a radio station in Toronto to be making the music picks for a radio station in Kingston or in Kitchener, Waterloo and surrounding areas and whatnot kind of thing. So it has definitely really become uh, again, just very structured, very uh, just based on research. And a lot of that comes usually through a program called BDS Nielsen, which um, is a website that does, you know, radio tracking and, and things like that. You can access music through that. But a lot of the music decisions are made specifically by those charts that you can find through BDS Nielsen and their radio charts that are broken down by genre. So you'd have your country, your chart for us at Element FM, we take a look at the contempor contemporary hit radio chart and the hot AC chart. And we actually look at some of the um, sort of like um, alternative rock or modern rock as well, because we do play some more like dance your pop on our stage on Element FM, but we're sort of like an anomaly in that it really is very structured very much based on those on that research and charts through BDS Nielsen and certainly through music testing as well. That becomes a bigger thing, although I think that is something that's really involving in the commercial radio industry right now. Uh, I think some of the big companies are investing a little bit less in music testing, but that has been an important thing. And that's something that they're considering as well, where they're doing either emailed surveys where they just include some short song clips and encourage people to take the survey, listen and rate the songs or larger scale, what is called auditorium testing, where they will pay people a certain amount of money, promise them lunch, that kind of stuff, and have them sort of sit in a big room for a few hours and listen to music and then rate it sort of on the spot in person. So uh, very meticulous, I think, is how some of the music selections are happening in commercial radio. And I think that means that you as artists definitely have to do a little bit more homework and do a little bit more work to uh, make sure you're servicing your music uh, the right way and to the right people and the right stations. Right. Barry, how does that differ from community radio and what, what you're involved in with Earshot? Well, I think that's a great way to outline uh, a lot of the differences because we work um, on a much more sort of case by case, uh, local level, or even show host level. So um, there, the big difference between campus and community, and this is generalization because it's always different in its own, is that um, campus stations are often put together with the staff and the programming schedule designed to be hosted by individual hosts. So some of these large stations have 100, 200 different hosts. And the station itself is not about deciding what goes on the air. It's providing the opportunity to train individuals so that they can be those showcase people. So there'll be a, a show about rock music, followed by a country show, followed by a show about horses. And that's just the way that a lot of those stations are sort of developed, which is great. The uh, community side does have a lot of those specialty programming because the requirements for their license do require them to have things like uh, non-popular music. And that's a little bit of a difference between our uh, sector and the the commercial sector. Our goal is to be essentially playing things that you don't hear on other spaces. So if you're going to hear them on Matthew's uh, station, we probably are not playing it. And that's that's sort of the way it, it works itself out. Um, so it's it's really quite a big mix of everything. Uh, 
there are program directors who oversee programming. There are music directors that oversee music um, in the community stations. Often those music directors or a music committee help select new content that goes onto the air. And there is sort of a, a softer rotation around content that gets played. Um, a lot of it usually focused on on local content, whatever is produced within the listening area. Um, and on the, the campus side of things, like I said, it, often it lands into the hands of those expert programmers, the ones that are coming to you and they know what Calypso music is and what great Calypso music is and what's brand new and, and hitting the ways. And they're the one showcasing it and sort of presenting it to you. So that's uh, when you add both of those sort of sectors together, you add the CBC, whose focus is on sort of the whole Canadian experience. I think one of the benefits about our sector or about radio is there is a place for everybody to get heard or to send your music to be heard, which is great. Yeah, that's great news. And I think that's a, a great takeaway to start off the top is that um, and I, I believe that about the music industry in general as well. You don't have to fit into a certain mold. There is room for everyone. There's room for you no matter where you are in your development. Um, and there's relationships to be built along the way. Um, so maybe speaking a little bit about relationships in radio, um, let's talk maybe about like, how do we approach a host? Um, what's the difference between a music director and a program director? and a host. Barry, do you want to touch on that? Yeah, so um, like I said, it varies across station by station. Um, a lot of the times the music director is there to help bring music into the radio station. So they're using a variety of different sources, whether that's uh, a system like uh, Earshot Distro or DMDS or Yangaroo or Play MPE, which are sort of the more commercialized versions of music distribution platforms, um, whether they're still getting CDs in the mail, they're still getting some stations receive 10, 15 CDs a day at times in the mail, um, or whether they get bombarded with emails with links and, and attachments and so on. So there's a variety of ways in which they're capturing music. Um, we did a, a two year study uh, looking at both the music industry and the broadcast industry to try to solve some of these challenges because um, there's a lot of different ways in which people can access music. Some of it is not legal. Some of it doesn't sort of follow um, the, uh, the expectations of how things go on the air. Um, some of it is digital and corrupt and poor quality and has viruses. So there's all those sort of different things to sort of keep in mind. Um, when you're looking at trying to get content to a campus or community radio station, uh, they all accept it in different forms. We try to push people towards Earshot Distro. Right now, our music distribution platform is just under 100 radio stations who have access and use that system. Another 100 or so broadcasters or radio hosts that use that system, and they go through that process and listen to right now, I think we're at 18, 19,000 songs in our database, which is sort of like a large library. And you can sort by different formats and structures and, and themes and, and characteristics of the people who are uploading um, to find what content you're looking for. Um, so the music directors will will sort of pull from there or their emails or, or wherever they get. And then they'll often, again, half will upload if their station is under their music control and they oversee what goes on the station. Uh, the other half will turn to their host says, hey, you do a jazz show. Here's a great new jazz uh, release that just came out. How about you have a listen and maybe you'll play it on your show. Maybe you won't. You're the expert. We don't know jazz that well, but we found it, so we passed it along. So that's often uh, a lot of the way how it works. Um, individual show hosts are often the curators of their own content, so they receive their content through way, all sorts of different ways as well. Um, and creating that con that connection, um, saying, "Hey, I have you know this genre that matches what you play." And if they've listened to what you, you do and they like, they're going to create that little relationship with you and are hoping that as new content comes out, you'll reach out and touch base with them. Same thing if you're traveling and touring and you're in the area, maybe you can come by and do the radio show or be involved in something with the station as well. So there's that personal relationship is something that you would like to be able to build towards. And we'll talk about 
some of those ways in which you can make that happen um, and some of the things you shouldn't be doing as well. Great, thanks. Matthew, you wanna to touch on commercial and how maybe how, uh, how we get music to, to commercial radio and, and the difference between the hosts there and, and music directors, program directors and how to approach them? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, just starting with, um, you know, the roles at the station, individual hosts at most commercial, uh, commercial radio stations are not making decisions on what is going on the air. It's a playlist that was sent from the music director the day before, usually through a program called Music Master and sent to an automation system. Um, Wide Orbit is a very common one that is used. Um, so the music director is the person who is scheduling the music is typically a first point of contact for record label or managers who are trying to get artists airplay. They are, you know, acquiring the, and, you know, putting together all the charts and everything and sort of preparing for what is usually a weekly or biweekly music meeting, which will include other staff. And it may include the program director, but the program director is more of a, a big picture person who is making more sort of overarching programming decisions and aren't necessarily the person that's going to have a final say on a song that gets played. I mean, that being said, if a program director comes across an incredible artist, they'll certainly work with the music director to ensure it gets on. But typically your music director is probably your more important uh, first point of contact if you're an artist looking to get music on the radio. And in terms of how to approach that, I think very much uh, the two keys are research and balance or moderation kind of thing. So the research is going back to, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of commercial radio is very structured, uh, very set on format. So know the format of the station you are contacting. If you're a hard rock, punk, metal band, don't even bother contacting the country station. It's just not going to happen. There's just no point in doing it. You're just wasting your time. Same thing for probably like the, the pop music station. Like it's just not really going to happen. So know your format and know your sound and do your research accordingly. So you know, first of all, in the first place, who you should be reaching out to. Uh, in terms of moderation, that I think to me is how much communication you want to have, because absolutely you do need to build a relationship with that music director, but just there's that fine balance, like in any relationship, I think that you don't want to be sending, you know, a hundred emails a week because that person is going to eventually just set you to go to the spam folder and that'll be that. But at the same time, if don't just send one email and then, well, they never got back to me. So that's it. So it's about balance, right? Like being consistent, but not overbearing, I think is key. And I think we're going to get into, you know, a little bit more specifics going forward. But I mean, I guess the first thing that I know that we would consider at Element FM, because we are sort of a unique beast, if you will, because a lot of our music decisions are based on the research, the radio charts, the BDS and whatnot. But the 30% Indigenous music we play, there aren't as many resources and hard and fast resources that other commercial stations are using to uh, basically rank or, you know, basically decide what, sh what music is most important in when it comes to those Indigenous artists. So there's definitely some resources we use every Saturday night on the station. We play the Indigenous Music Countdown, uh, which comes from uh, out in the prairies. And that is kind of a gauge for us, but it's not the one and only thing. So there is a chance with our station that you absolutely can submit music and get on our station because we are looking for those Indigenous artists. But I'd say the most important thing before we get into other questions and more specifics that we would look at when we're sort of assessing these Indigenous artist submissions is audio quality, production quality. Barry uh, mentioned it in his last uh, response that, you know, getting poor quality stuff it's just not going to work. We're just not going to do it as much as we want to support as many Indigenous artists as possible through Element. We also want to serve our audience and make sure they're liking what they're hearing coming out of their speakers and stuff. And so if it's poor sound quality, poor production value, unfortunately, it's just something we're not really going to consider. So I think that perhaps before you even consider reaching out to a music director is making sure you have your material and that it's solid and that the audio quality is a very high standard. Then you can start doing that research on the various music directors in your market or other markets as well, and making sure what you're submitting to them is appropriate for that format of that station. And again, you're being consistent with the communication, but not overbearing. Yeah, I, I, I like that you touched on, on the fact that you, I mean, the high audio quality is super important. And I think there's a number of things that you kind of need to get together before you start approaching. Um, so just because you have your mastered track doesn't necessarily mean you're ready to start pitching, right? So let's maybe talk about like what other materials 
uh, an artist needs to be able to pitch. I mean, we've got like a one sheet, we have like an elevator pitch, uh, keeping things organized. Do you put things in a Dropbox? How do you name a file? Um, let, let's, let's start with a one sheet. How important is a one sheet for campus and community radio, Gary? Uh, quite important uh, because these stations are getting sent with all sorts of content all the time. And within our sector, there's probably only around a dozen music directors in total. Um, and that's across 180 radio stations. So it's usually only the larger stations that have access and time to it. And the smaller stations, there are volunteer committees, a volunteer individual, and that's it. So um, you need to be sending content that is clean, easy to understand, well-labeled, well-formatted, um, and meets the specifics. Um, we did a, a two-year research study that has a handful of, of recommendations. I'll just share my screen right now, and I'll give you a couple of examples of, of some of that documentation that comes up there. So when you're labeling it, make sure in the title, you know, you're saying music submission, if it's going to a general inbox type thing. Uh, the song should be labeled with an artist name, a song, a remix. If you're putting a record label on there, you, nothing worse than downloading a song and suddenly it says track one dot mp3 and then you open the file and there's no metadata whatsoever there's no chance you're going to ever get played nobody's going to find out remember where that song came from and you can't find it in your system so um make can we sure pause all of that's done. on that yeah let's dig into metadata a little bit more just so that people know what we're talking about here and how do you tag an mp3 yeah, so metadata is the uh, information that is attached and found with inside of an MP3. And it's actually quite simple to do. Um, a lot of the software programs that when you save a file, you'll see, you know, the file format that you're saving it at, the bit rate and all of that. And then they'll have a metadata option. If you've already saved a file, that's not a problem as well. You can simply find it on your computer. Uh, if you're using a PC, you would right click, go to the very bottom where it'll say properties of the file. You'll open the properties and right on the top, you're going to see a whole bunch of uh, little tabs and one of those tabs will be metadata and you'll have the opportunity to input all sorts of information uh, name recording location song title original publisher the date the genre all of these things are very helpful especially if your content is very niche or focused so uh we'd highly recommend you do that and you can even add in things like artwork which we always suggest you upload at a thousand pixels by a thousand pixels because sometimes people like to see that artwork um that was always the push when people were sending in vinyl and cd is because that cover art had so much valuable information and what's attracted you as well. So that can still be done on the digital format too. Great. Um, Matthew, are you, are you, how important is a one sheet for commercial radio? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, I think Barry covered a lot of really good stuff there. I think a lot of this is applicable to both commercial and campus community radio. And I also want to say, I want to play the campus card for a second and just say that as a former programmer at a campus community station, those one sheets were amazing. And especially it was so nice to even in the older CDs, even older like artists that have been around for a while to read their one sheet from their first couple of albums. And now they're, you know, this big band kind of thing. And I would say with those as well, be as creative as you can with them. Like, yes, include, you know, pertinent information, band members, where you're from and everything. But I just found you could tell some were just more well-written and more uh, captivating and engaging than others. And so that's something I would recommend as well. But um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, who you are, like, you know, you know, what kind of your genre is a little bit of a backstory. And I think the more creative, the better as well. Um, and that, yeah, that can really be important as well from a um, uh, commercial radio standpoint too, for sure. Yeah, Barry, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just popping the address for this document that lives on the Earshot website um, into the chat so that everybody can copy it and uh, access it whenever they want to. Um, cause there's a lot of really great information on that sheet. And I love that you guys have broken down. I, I love the earshot system. I I'm hundred percent behind it. And I think it's a really great way 
um, to get a lot of information out to a, a lot of people in one central place. So super stoked that Earshot started in Ottawa. I think that's amazing. Um, I wouldn't mind um, sharing my screen with you just for a quick second to, and I have a million tabs open in my life, so hopefully this is going to work. Um, but uh, I want to show you a one sheet that I did for, um, for Digging Roots when I worked with this band. Um, and so this is, hopefully you can see that okay. This is an example of a one sheet. Um, and for you guys to see the details of the information is less important than just kind of the look of it. So um, it's important to have, you know, your your funders at the bottom um, and some information on on booking. I'm going from the bottom up here, but information on booking, radio tracking, PR, like the team. Um, and then you'll see sort of like around the release date, the time, the BPM, uh, you know, all of this stuff is, is you can find online, you can do a quick Google of what do I need for a radio one sheet and you can, and then towards the top, you always have a photo of the, um, in the middle, you have a photo of the album cover. Um, I, as a radio tracker would put four fans of, and, uh, that's something that I worked with the artist on, um, to decide what that, what those artists are. Um, and so that that gives somebody uh, a sort of intro into oh this is this is what this music kind of sounds like, um, and then a bit of a bio at the top and and anything pertinent about the um, about the track. I found it as a radio tracker important to put a quote from the album because a lot of people end up using this one sheet uh, directly in PR things so if you can like uh eliminate i guess part of uh the work somebody needs to do in order to get information from you uh then the better and so i found giving a quote uh was an easy way for somebody to copy and paste that and write an article around that or uh you know use it on air or whatever the case may be so any like little kind of extras you can give that are just beyond a little bit beyond the bio, go a little bit deeper because this is a one sheet that is specific to this track or this album. Um, yeah, if anybody needs um, to see an example of a one sheet again, uh, and you can't find it online, feel free to send me an email, and I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to show you a bit more about that. That was um, a very good one sheet, Melanie. That was awesome. And yeah, the image. And I, one of the things that I always like to like as a, a, you know, as a programmer at the campus community stations is the for fans of or sounds like like that is a nice little thing to have as well. Um, another thing I would add, um, and I know we're going to probably get into some more specifics in a bit, but you also included the ISRC code, which is very important mm -hmm. as well. So definitely, if you're ever sending your stuff out to commercial radio stations, make sure you include that ISRC code, just make sure you're good to go on displays and cars and everything, because still the bulk of, you know, commercial radio listenership is happening in vehicles and so that's how people are like this is a new song i've not heard of this what is this they can get that display but if you don't have that just makes it a bit trickier another site we are using lately as well just sort of in our music scheduling program music master for you know flow on our station is a, a website called TuneBat, where you can look up songs and get like the BPMs as you included, uh, energy levels, things like that. And so if you can provide any statistics for some of your songs along those lines, that can be helpful as well. I don't know that a ton of commercial stations are using it, but that's another thing to consider as well. But yes, especially the ISRC code is greatly appreciated. So we don't have to ask as well. And I would say actually just another thing for us that we usually end up asking our indigenous artists when we add their music is also include a little artist drop. Hi, this is Cameron. This is my new song, title of song on Element FM, that kind of thing. But I also certainly would encourage you to get creative with it. That was the most boring one you've ever heard. But if you can get creative with it, inject your personality into it, that's something we're typically asking for. And I think a lot of commercial stations are, are using those artist drops too with new music IDs and things like that. So that's also important. Right. Um, let's touch into the ISRC for a quick second because. Um, let, well, why don't we let Barry explain what an ISRC code and what it does? Sure. It, it's essentially a digital fingerprint that is applied to any song that's made. So uh, it's done internationally. Uh, Canadian artists start with the CA. Um, you can register online. I don't believe there's a cost to do it. And uh, simply you'll you'll go 
you'll just do a search for ISRC and um, follow through the registration process. Uh, it'll give you a combination of letters, sort of like your account number, and then it will give you a bunch of extra zeros at the end. And as you create songs that are released, you identify each song with one of those letters, send that information along through that uh, registration format, uh, and then you're sort of put into that international database. And we do use it on Earshot Distro as a tracking program. It's not mandatory, but it, as was noted, it's very helpful for tracking content. It's very helpful for making sure that you have the right name, um, spelling, all of that type of information, because if you happen to have volunteers or other people who, you know, switch a name around or something of that nature, when you go to charting, um, if you're looking at some of the national charts, if you happen to have two things that are very similar, but not quite well separate, they're not going to make the charts, but combined they should. And if you're able to get on to the earshot district or the earshot charts, um, that's very helpful if you're a factor artist, because it allows you to apply to factor to sort of push yourself up to that next tier of support. So it could be a difference between, you know, $5,000 to help with uh, an album or $25,000 to go shoot a music video, those types of things. Yeah, super important. And uh, let's talk about ISRC in conjunction with royalties, Matthew. Yeah, so I mean, we having things like factor obviously really important too, but we also as radio stations, we pay fees to SOCAN. And so just helping to make sure basically you get paid for your spins. Um, they're a, a very solid organization. They're very consistent where basically every month uh, commercial radio stations have to file a report with them and a few other affiliated organizations that basically list every single thing that's aired on the station. And that is all tracked and that's how they disperse funds and whatnot kind of thing. So yeah, getting connected with SOCAN, I think is another really important step. And it, you know, it, it does monetize it. Sometimes I do see like independent artists kind of joking about sometimes how much the fees they get kind of thing, but it's a start, but it's also a way, yes, I think to really track your success and get a sense of, wow, this station in Alberta is playing my song. I didn't know that kind of thing. So that's a really important affiliation to have as well. And um, yeah, it's basically how we ensure that artists who are getting uh, airplay on the station are getting rewarded uh, for that content. And it happens in the campus and community as well, just not as frequent because our reporting is two weeks a year and then it's extrapolated out to, to guesstimate how many people have been played. So um, the advantage of the SOCAN reporting time is many stations and many hosts take that as an opportunity to make sure they're playing more Canadian content, make sure they're showcasing those artists that they really like. Um, and that that's a benefit to, to you if you're able to get in on that time frame. Unfortunately, if you're not in the time frame that gets played, you may have a number one album hit that is on the charts for 15, 20 weeks. Um, but if the reporting period was the week before you released and the week after you dropped off, uh, you might not get any royalties there. Um, radio stations pay 1.9% of their total uh, expenses of the previous year into royalties. So that may sound like a lot or not. Uh, it ranges from something like $500. And I think the top stations are paying around $20,000 a year. Um, much more on the commercial side. So if you're aiming for that commercial success, that's where you're going to see um, the value of SOCAN coming through. But as Matthew said, uh, it can still be used as a great tool for reporting um, and to see where you're getting traction played because a lot of the time, uh, and we've got lists of people who have come out of the broadcasting, the community and campus side of broadcasting and have gone on uh, to either make their career musically or as a broadcaster on the commercial side of things. So uh, it's really important to get started and, and the campus community side is very much the place for starting um, and a little less forgiving or a little more forgiving um, if, if something's not quite there and it gives you the chance to build and grow and develop your sound. Yeah, and further to that point um, from Barry, that if you do see that, yeah, you're getting play in one area, that can also help you adjust your strategy of how you want to market yourself. You know, maybe even uh, hammering away at stations in one particular market, but then you see you're getting some traction in another market. 
start reaching out to other, you know, program directors, music directors in that market and see if you can sort of help build that way. I think that's another thing to consider. Yeah, that's really great, you guys. Um, we've got about maybe like 10 minutes until we go into a Q&A. I'd love for um, for folks to be able to see the earshot system, Barry, if you're into it, uh, and maybe the MBS for you, Matthew, and show how uh, how how easy it is really for artists to start um, getting moving on this stuff and uh, start submitting online. Yeah, uh, earshot-distro.ca is the website to go to. You would simply click the sign up option here. Um, once you've signed up, you'll be able to select an independent artist or a record label. Uh, you have to be Canadian based at this time. We're only taking Canadian artists as a way to make sure that we're sourcing content for, for there. Um, the difference between label and independent artist is if you're a label distributor, you can have multiple artists. Other than that, everything else is the same. When you get access, uh, it is free to sign up. Uh, you'd simply log in um, and you'll end up seeing um, a dashboard that you land on. It'll talk, show you all of your artist names on the one side, any recent interactions, how many songs, their song list and their bio. Um, so for example, Adam Nix here has had 19 interactions. And if I click on the interactions, I can see the radio station. If they listened to downloaded the song, supported it, the dates and all of that kind of stuff as well, any ratings, and it will indicate the likelihood uh, and interest that someone's picked up your song. Um, to create and upload a song, it's very simple. Um, our system sort of works like a pizza. Um, you have to have a release with an artist and then your songs on it. So uh, you would simply uh, click to upload a song uh, here. You'll select an artist. Uh, if you haven't made one, you can create a new artist. Uh, you'll then select a release. If you haven't made a release, you'll create a new release. And then you'll simply upload your songs. When those songs uploaded, um, they'll end up landing on a release that you have. Uh, so here's an example of one of the uh, releases where you're putting your, your logo, what type of release um, you're uploading to. In our system, it costs $7 a song to release or $50 an album for songs uh, between 8 and 20 songs. So uh, that's before any discounts and so on. You select your genres, your subgenre, your hypergenre, the city you're in, the region you're in, when it was released, when it was available for the public, room for light lyrics, distributor, publisher, label. You can apply licenses to this. So every time you upload a content, it automatically gives you the broadcast license. But if you want to, you can allow it so that the song is available to be used in podcasts, which is pretty neat. Um, we have special characteristics for artists. So if you identify as, uh, as queer, you could say you're queer and indigenous. And then when someone does a search for those titles, it is more discoverable. So it's a great way to be able to identify in a different ways. And then we have our MAPL. Um, and simply put, when all that goes together, you end up with a song that is on a dashboard. And I'll give you an example. This is what it would look like for the public. And they're able to see their information of everything that you uploaded, the song details, play the song, the album art, ability to contact you if there were reviews or anything of that nature. Um, so quite simple as a process to do. We also have a great little option for messaging. So you can, uh, radio stations can reach out to you and you can have a conversation back and forth. And there's this great little option for outreach um, and what outreach does is it takes you to our website in the back and it gives you a list of radio stations and they've uh, submitted the type of information and the type of songs that they want. So if I was looking to submit to CKVE in uh, Nova Scotia at Hubbard's Cove, we know who the station director is, their email, what they're looking for. So you would know pop, rock, country, folk, jazz, and blues is the content that they're looking for. So if you were making death metal, unfortunately, probably the Cove is not your, your main spot to reach out to, but it does give you information on what format, how they get it, all that kind of stuff as well. So some really benefits to that, and that's available for you 
Um, the only time that there is a fee is when you process the song to put it from upload live into our album or into archive and it remains as is um, on the system forever. There's no additional fees or anything of that nature. And uh, as I showed off the top, you can see who is playing yours. So that's the system that we developed on our side of things called Earshot Distro. Uh, and again, it's the um, very equivalent to what Matthew will sort of talk about, but with the focus on it going to the campus and community stations. This is so great. Thanks for showing us that, Barry. Um, just a quick question for you about if an artist has an album that's been out for a while and they want to put it on earshot, what does that look like? And are they likely to get spun? Yeah, um, the advantage of earshot is that it is an album, it's an archive. Um, so we have artists that are uploading new albums, they're also putting up their back catalog. Uh, and a lot of the time for the back catalog is that discoverability option. If I come across someone who is new, and they just put out a single, because um, we accept singles in here, and I go, oh, that's great. Do they have anything else? And pop it up and find if, if something was 20 years old and is on the system, to me, it depends on if I'm going to play it on my show or not, because I'm an individual, I've got that chance to be able to decide. Um, a lot of the time, like I said, in campus or community, it is more of a one one on one decision on who's playing what content. It's not nearly as rotational. Um, so having that back album uh, back archive is is quite helpful for um for the individuals this, again especially if you're looking at uh specialty programming or genres that are hard to find um and if you are you know making polka music there's not that many polka artists so it would be great to find you and then maybe you'll get lots of plays because of that sort of rotational requirement awesome thanks barry and matthew do you want to show us your um your your I was gonna say, do you want to show us your back end? Sure. Yeah, that yeah, sounds yeah. a bit weird. <laughs> uh, no, that's perfect. And I'll just be uh, really quick because yeah, I don't really have it from the sort of submission perspective. So this is DMDS, Yanguru. This is where a lot of labels, management, and I'm sure independent artists are servicing their music to commercial radio stations. Um, and the cool thing about this is that you can, I mentioned earlier about doing that research and making sure you're sending your music to the right stations. If your whatever music you're making doesn't fit that format, there's no point in sending it. So through uh, Yangaroo DMDS, you can specifically submit it to particular music directors, program directors, or staff. And so I'm, you know, on a list of that's basically under sort of like program directors. And so I'm generally getting things that uh, a lot of the major labels are knowing that we would likely play kind of things. So we get some Beyonce here, Glass Animals sort of thing. But then we also get, you know, some independent stuff as well. But yeah, that's sort of the top line. Like, I think if you're looking to get exposure on commercial radio, I think your three options, and Barry mentioned it earlier, is through this, through DMDS. If you can start your account here, submit through that. Uh, Barry also mentioned Play MPE, which is a very similar thing. It's a little bit uh, newer, but it's another way. I know for me, it's always a backup if I don't find it on here. Play MPE is kind of where I'm going next to find it. And then your final option is really just to email. But the cool thing about Yangaroo and DMDS is you can kind of do both. So as you can see here, I've got this. This is like an independent artist. I don't know much about them, but they submitted something to me through DMDS. But I also get this email that also has some one sheet like details, like contact information, a little bit of a bio on the song. I like this too, like upcoming interviews and things like that. So just showing where else they're kind of getting exposure because that might sometimes inform the decision of the music director or the program director to make the decision to uh, to play that artist. And um, yeah, sorry, I'm just going to make this go up here. Um, and yeah, because I also just wanted to show, um, hold on, this thing is like, Yeah, there we go. I know how to use the internet. Uh, this is also just quickly BDS Nielsen. And so as you can see here, just to be really quick, this is where you can find lists of charts. Um, you can make your own custom charts based on the specific stations you're following. This is a great program from a, a radio station and programming perspective, but it's just also where a lot of the music decisions are being informed. And so if, yeah, if you look at format charts, which most stations will do, they're breaking down into the particular format. So adult contemporary, adult hits, all formats, probably not being used as much, not quite as helpful. CHR top 40, which would be one that we would look at for element, 
Um, and then we would also look at the modern rock as well. And so you just bring that up and just this program knows all the stations that are falling under that format and they're calculating their spins from all of those stations combined to come up with this chart sort of thing. So yeah, those are the main things to consider. And I think, again, if you are submitting stuff just through email, if you don't have access to Plan P or DMDS, Yangaroo, I think it's just, you know, making sure that you develop that relationship. And even it could be just, hey, can you take a listen to this and let me know what you think? Not just, can you play this now? Goodbye. Um, you know, building that relationship and, and following up accordingly. And um, yeah, just trying to, you know, really just, yeah, have a really solid relationship with the music director can go a long way. And I think that's really important that BDS charts not seem to low, low, load here, but they also uh, have like streaming charts and things like that as well. So a really helpful program that, again, informs a lot of the decisions we're making at the commercial stations. And, and I would just add that distribution it can be expensive. Um, so organizations like DMBS, you could be you know, $1,000 type thing for it. Uh, Earshot Distro is on the bottom end. We charge $50 for, for it to go into the system. Um, but again, uh, email can work the same way. The thing that I would cautious about it, or caution you about is uh, if you're sending through email, it, links need to be direct download to high quality. So don't be attaching a 128 MP3. Um, don't be sending people to Bandcamp or SoundCloud or YouTube, technically those don't provide broadcasting rights for you to put on the air. Um, and try your best to make sure it you're not, you know, here's a new song, go to our site to, to have a listen to and get back to me if you want it. Stations don't have the time to do that extra work. They would like you to be able to provide them with that high quality easy one or two clicks to get to where they need to so that they can review it, download it, say, thank you so much. We're going to put it on the air. If they even get back to you to say that because they're going through hundreds of these in a week. Yeah. Just quickly want to echo that two very good points for sure. Um, you know, making sure that it is that quality it's radio station quality. It can be played. It's not just a link out to a website or SoundCloud and yes, make it as easy as possible for the music director as well. Um, uh, yeah. I was going to make a joke about us being lazy, but no, sorry. <laughs> um, I think that's really important information about the relationship building part of it. And I think that's so helpful um, to know in the music industry in general that um, I think um, I think some people, especially people outside of the music industry, assume it's a sort of scenario where you get discovered and you get brought to the top and you're in a big office and there's a board table and somebody's like we're gonna sign you and here you go and it's totally not the case at all um i know people that have been in the music industry for a while understand the importance in relationships um but i think on that there are different places that you can go in order to connect with hosts and radio djs and music directors and a lot of those places that i've met folks is at conferences and so if you're a francophone, you might be going to Contact en Terroir. If you're a folk artist, you might be going to Folk Music Ontario uh, or Folk Alliance. Uh, you know, if you're an Indigenous artist, you might be getting in touch with the Indigenous Music Summit. Um, and so you can kind of tailor um, who you're meeting and running into folks uh, at different events. And I think that is way, I mean, it's difficult because we've lived through a pandemic uh, that is still happening right now. And so it's, it's, it's not as easy to build relationships on Zoom or through email. And people are getting more emails now than ever. And so they're overloaded. And I think a lot of hosts and music directors are overloaded. So if you're not hearing back, um, you know, gently follow up, but um, it might not be the right time. And that's another beautiful piece of advice in the music industry is like, no, just means not right now. So just like keep working on your stuff and keep going. Um, but if you can put yourself in that position where you are physically in person with someone uh, and you're meeting someone, or um, I mean, like if you also wanna take somebody out for coffee and pick their brain, like those are really great ways to build relationships uh, with people. And it feels less like selling yourself and you're actually building a relationship because if you're in the music industry, you want to be doing this for the long term, right? So, um, and you'll notice that a lot of people change jobs through the music industry, but the people remain the same. And so it's really relationship based. So 
Um, I'm just Ma- looking at the questions in the, oh yeah, go ahead. So I just want to quickly add, and just, you know, if you're not sure how to start that conversation with that music director, they're a music director for a reason, music, start the conversation about that. Hey, did you hear the new Kendrick? Hey, did you go to Oshiega? It's like, whatever, like, it doesn't have to just be, can you play my stuff? Like build that relationship by having that ongoing dialogue. And then like music is the great connector and, you know, conversation starter. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, I'm looking at the questions in the chat here, um, and uh, I think I touched a bit on the francophone stations. The beautiful thing, Jesse, about the francophone stations is because it's a small, um, it's a small community. Uh, once you start reaching out to hosts in the French community, uh, and one of them starts playing you, other people know about that very quickly. And it sort of, I mean, it kind of does spread in the commercial and campus and community way as well as like, if one person's on board, then you're more likely to get other people on board. So um, there are specific people that you can reach out to in the Francophone, um, in the Francophone world. And, um, and like, you can also start by like Googling, uh, you know, friends or other artists that are similar to you and the word radio. And you'll see where they're getting spun. I mean, that's another thing. There are a number of different stations that you can see if you are getting spins. One of them is called Spinitron, S-P-I-N-I-T-R-O-N. And you can see for free if you've been spun or if anybody's been spun in the last 24 hours. So you can Google like, oh, uh, my music is similar to this person uh, who's releasing stuff right now. Let's see where they're being played. And so you can kind of pick and choose your own adventure based on based on that but um you know francophone artists i would suggest there's a a contact on terroir happens in january every year and it's a conference and it brings people together and it's a great way to uh connect with with folks so see what's happening in your genre if there are central points that you can connect with people um there's a question about an epk what is uh is an epk worthwhile and what should it include um I know that EPKs are super important in the booking world. Um, how important are they in the radio world, guys? I think just really it's similar to, you know, kind of the one pager. Like as long as you have that information that was in that very great one that you had done, I think as long as you're giving that some way, whether it's through an EPK, whether it's through just a single document, as long as you're giving them that information, that's what's important. Yeah, nothing to add there. I thought it, it they are similar enough. Um, but again, if if your goal is radio, then then stick sort of with the one pager and and try to make sure it's as succinct and easy to find uh, as possible. Um, the larger press kits can be helpful um, if you're looking to try to do touring and stuff like that as well. But uh, like I said, and like you've very well said uh it's about making that relationship so if i suddenly have to go through seven or eight pages to find the information i'm looking for that might take too long Mm -hmm. yeah um thanks for that question there rob um cyrus is asking is it generally worth getting outside help for radio tracking any advice on finding a radio tracker to work with i wouldn't mind starting this one um it's uh, there are a, a lot of jobs, uh, there's a labor shortage in the music industry in general. Um, and this is where I'm going to tell everybody that like, if you want to get in the game and you want to become a PR agent, you want to become a radio tracker, you want to be, you, know, you want to get into booking. If you're an artist, you already have these skills. Like if you've been doing this for even a couple of years, you already have these skills And I would love to see more artists taking the plunge into developing these skills with other people and for themselves. Because I can tell you firsthand that the work that I did as a PR agent and radio tracker has helped my career as well. So me helping others and getting paid for it on the side is helpful as well. So in terms of like finding a radio tracker, finding a PR agent, getting a manager, getting a booking agent, it all really depends on where you're at and what workload and bandwidth you have. I think that's kind of a a few folks get into the music industry and they're like, well, I want to get booked. So I need a booking agent. 
it's not quite the way it works right now. And I wish it was still the seventies where a label would sign you and then give you a month in a studio to develop. And they would like, you know, they would really take their time right now. You know, everybody is short on time. Um, and there is a lot of talent out there. So you really need to create those relationships and build your own career before folks will start looking at you. So is it worth getting PR or radio tracking? Sometimes absolutely it can be. Um, it all depends on what your return on investment and what your goals are in the music industry as well. Um, and so like beautiful systems like Earshot make it easy for you to upload your music in there, for you to connect with these radio folks. And then once you've started doing that, then you have um, a track record and it's easy to get a radio tracker who can kind of open up a different world for you and do something that you can't already do for yourself, but build on your career. So think of it as like a ladder with like different levels and it's not necessarily going to the top of something. And sometimes you're going diagonally, but who is it that can help you get further than you can on your own without skipping a rung either? I think it's important to note that like, there are so many um, important relationships that happen through the building of your career and uh, skipping steps is not necessarily gonna make you feel successful or more fulfilled and is not necessarily going to help you in the long term. So radio tracking, for example, I mean, can cost between $1,000 and 6000 or 10000 per single. So where is that money coming from in your career? Are you willing to spend that? Is it the right time in your career to spend it on that? Are you spending money uh, with someone that you know is going to help this come further or you know is it is it are you sinking money into an unsure uh bet because a lot of pr and radio tracking is uncertainty there's no guarantees that anything is going to get played there's no guarantees that anybody's going to blog or write about you or even show up to your show so i think doing a lot of your own work in uh in a grassroots way of connecting with these folks until you get to that point where you're like, I can't, like, I don't have enough time to do this anymore. And that can happen at many different times in your career. And I think it also depends on like, is your music radio friendly or not? Do you guys have stuff to add on that? I mean, you're the expert. So like, yeah, that's definitely, <laughs> I, I, you know, air to you on that. But I mean, it can help you really get your foot in the door to have someone, either a record label rep or a tracker. But, you know, as you alluded to, it's not a guarantee for anything. Um, really, it's just, does it fit the format of the station? Is it, you know, trending? Is it something that they think has a lot of possibility? It That's really boiling down to the music directors and the music committees at the various stations. Um, the tracker, you know, if, if it's somebody who you rely on, you trust, yeah, it's absolutely going to get you a little further, but it's not a guarantee that it's going to get on. Yeah. I, you know what? I'd love to see, I'd love to see part of the mission with Omic is, um, is to really like create a tight community. And we're going to start doing that with a member portal. Eventually uh, we're working out some kinks right now, but I would love to see people um, getting together and not, not necessarily having to go it on their own, but like sharing information amongst each other, because it does take a long time to get a good list of radio or media or whatever the case may be. So are there people that you trust in your circle of musicians that you guys can kind of do that work together and share that amongst yourselves? Um, and, and then you're sharing kind of relationships and, I would love to see more kind of community building on a grassroots level that way. And you don't always necessarily need a gatekeeper to get you where you need to go. Let's like start thinking about how we can build the infrastructure of, of the community more like a braid together uh, than just deferring to, oh, well, that person is the, is the, you know, is the gatekeeper for that. And, uh, and the only way through is through that direction. Like, I, I don't believe that there's only one way through. And, and like we said at the top, there's room for everybody. So 
who can you connect with in your circle to help build your lists and who can you connect with in terms of hosts that, you know, that will also help you develop moving forward. Um, it's a couple minutes after three. Uh, happy to, um, to take another question if you guys want to hang out. Um, thanks, Barry, so much for including that. 25% um, off your first 10 purchases at Earshot uh, with that code below. Um, I'm going to leave that special code for, um, for folks just here in the chat in Zoom. Um, and uh, as a you had to be here kind of uh, <laughs> a carrot, I guess. Um, but this, uh, this whole thing has been recorded and, um, and we're going to post this on our member portal eventually so that artists and, uh, and music workers can uh, access this sort of thing. Um, one thing that I'd love to do uh, with Matthew and Barry, and maybe you guys can check in, um, uh, or the, everybody who's online right now can kind of check in uh, a week from now. Uh, right now it's August 7th, so maybe I'll give us a week. But um, we'll post on the IMB um, page of the OMIC website just a few resources that are helpful that we spoke about during this conversation. Um, Emma's asking, is that for 10 singles uh, or is it done? There we go. <laughs> Barry's answering 10 purchases. So 10 albums or 10 singles. How about that? That's awesome. Um, there is obviously so much that we could have, like my brain is spinning now because I'm like thinking about so many other things that we could have touched on uh, to get further into this conversation. But I want to thank Matthew and Barry so much for starting us off. Uh, I feel like there was a lot of really great information in there. Um, anything you guys want to say as we wrap this up? Uh, other than thanks for, for having us and um, we are actively and always looking for new content, uh, at least in the campus community side. And I know Matthew with a lot of the work that's happening at the two, two stations that he's involved with uh, and, and the CBC, very much looking for new specifically Canadian content. Um, if you have any questions for us, uh, you can reach support at earshot-distro.ca and we're happy to, to follow back and help you with if it's uploads or best practices or whatnot, we're, we're available to help out because that's what we're here to do is to try to make that connection between the music industry and the broadcast industry because uh, we're parallel in so many ways. Um, and without, without your music, we would just be talking and I should not talk too much more. Yeah, I think for me, one of the best things about uh, working at Element FM is the new artist discoveries, specifically new Indigenous artists going into it. I, you know, knew a handful, but that's been a big part of, you know, my experience at Element is learning more. And so we're certainly always looking for music as well. And just don't hesitate to reach out. I put my uh, email in the chat, even if you just have questions about not necessarily getting your music on Element, but questions about sending music out and, and different options or any of your experiences with some of the record lab, record reps, I should say, or label people or music trackers I've got experience with quite a few and you know can definitely offer you know just my insight on my experience with them but yeah reach out I feel like the the silly thing I wanted to say was this is one in, uh, one situation where it's it is good to do your own research and look up all these stations and these music directors and build those connection connections because I think that's the best way to um, really get your stuff on the air is uh, through you know building these relationships with some of the people at these stations so best of luck to everybody yeah. and thanks for coming yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for being here. If anybody has um, ideas about uh, what they want to learn about, this has been IMB 45, Get Your Music on Radio. Uh, there are so many topics that we can cover. If anybody wants to uh, submit a suggestion for an IMB, you can do that uh, through our, the link in our bio uh, on Instagram on our link tree. Um, also, we are planning a branding and marketing uh, IMB uh, sometime in August. So I would really suggest to everyone right now to like sign up to Oh Mike's newsletter, uh, sign up to or follow us on socials, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. That's the best way to get all of the information um, you guys need as to what's happening right now. 
And um, yeah, we are going to see you all very soon, hopefully in person. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, everyone, for being here. We're O Mike, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. <laughs>